Today on Let the Bible Speak. Four things the great Apostle Paul wanted a younger preacher to know about the grace of God. Next. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. It's a privilege to speak with you about the Word of God, and thanks for joining me on this Lord's Day. There is not a more thrilling, comforting, exhilarating, and calming truth taught in the Word of God than that of the grace of God. One of the most beloved and well-known hymns of all time is called Amazing Grace, and grace truly is amazing. You know, some find it incredible that a loving God could allow a person that He created to go to hell. But that's not incredible, for we have all at one time rebelled against God. We have sinned against God. We have offended God and His holiness. What's amazing is that a holy God could allow us who have sinned into heaven. But He does, and we can attribute that to His wonderful grace. But it's very important that we understand what grace is, what it does, how and to whom it is applied, and that we understand its boundaries or its limits. And grace does have its boundaries. Now, a single sermon could not begin to address, much less exhaust, all of the scriptures that teach us something about God's grace. But thankfully, in one short text, Paul concisely deals with four aspects of the grace of God that I think we all need to understand. And these four truths can quickly dispel many of the false notions that people have about grace, and if you're a Christian, they can make your Christian life all the much sweeter and richer and more vibrant if you understand what Paul is teaching in these verses. For our scripture reading, let's turn to Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 11, where the apostle writes, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. How do you view the grace of God? Is it unconditionally received? Is it an umbrella that covers all of our sins, whether we ever repent of them or not? Is it only offered to certain people? Well, those are all questions that we will look to the Bible to answer today in part one of a two-week study. The title of the lesson simply lifted from this text, The Grace of God, and I'll return with that after a song. Christ the Lord is Grace is one of the most commonly used doctrinal terms in the New Testament, appearing 128 times in the New King James translation. 
Obviously, it's important. The word simply means favor or goodwill or loving kindness and is used several ways in the Bible. It doesn't always refer to the grace shown when God saves us from our sins initially. It can mean favor shown to the Christian in living the Christian life. God, for example, provides the Christian with strength and comfort and suffering and calls that grace in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. Uh, he gives us the grace we need to serve Him and to serve others. He gives us grace even to sing in our trials and our difficult circumstances. But today we're talking about God's saving grace. This is what Paul was talking about in our text, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people zealous for good works. Paul puts the amazing grace of God into proper perspective for us in these four verses. And we need that perspective because as the Bible itself warns, there are many misrepresentations and abuses of grace being taught and believed not only in Paul's world then but in the world today. Some underestimate the grace of God, instead relying on their own righteousness, which is no righteousness at all. The Bible makes it clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, and that no person is righteous before God in and of themselves. Both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. There is none righteous, no, not one, said Paul in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. In other words, it matters not how hard a person tries, how good their intentions are, what their lineage is, how devoutly religious they are, all still find themselves under sin and therefore condemned. Now that should humble every one of us before God and before others. We are all in critical need of the grace and mercy of God and we will not make it without God's grace. We should never underestimate that need. But there are just as many, if not more, who overestimate the grace of God. They almost see it as a naive and sentimental emotion on the part of God that just overlooks the sins we commit simply because God loves us so much and in effect He can't bring Himself to uh, allow us to be lost. So grace, in effect, provides us with a blank check to live as we please and God will save us regardless. Now that's not true either. Both are severe perversions of God's saving grace. So it would do us well to look closely at what Paul tells Titus and to see the four things that he teaches about the grace of God. And we're going to talk about one of them in our study this week. First of all, Paul shows us that the grace of God is redeeming grace. Redeeming grace. Salvation from sin involves redemption. For without the intervention of God, we are sold out to sin. Our souls are in the clutches of the devil, and we thus share in the condemnation that is promised him one day. We are condemned as sinners. But though Christ, or through Christ, I should say, God has redeemed those who have believed in Christ, repented of their sins, confessed the Lord, and obeyed the gospel in baptism. Now, this is the case because of God's grace and no other cause. There was no other impetus to salvation but the grace of God. Now look carefully in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, For the grace of God which brings salvation. Now mankind has offered nothing that would induce God to be kind and give us anything except the judgment we deserve. We all fall short. No person listening to me today, nor any other person who lives, has ever lived, or ever will live to the age of accountability except the Lord Jesus Christ Himself has ever lived a sinlessly perfect life. Every single one of us has broken the law of God. We have done the things that God said not to do, and we have failed to do things that God has told us to do. Well, both are sin. And that means every one of us, without Christ, appears before God as a sinner. And the soul that sins is under the penalty of death, Ezekiel 18, verse 20, Romans 6, and verse 23. And that is a universal statement. 
Now, you may regret the sins you've done in the past. You may try to clean up your life. You may try to please God going forward by doing all that you can do. But that within itself, as critical as all of those actions are, that within itself does not rectify the sins that you've committed in the past, nor will you live the rest of your life without at some point falling short of God's perfect standard. So the question is, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us up a creek without a paddle. It leaves us on the sure path to eternal hell. Friend, again, it's not so hard to believe that God would condemn a sinner. It's hard to understand how He can save a sinner without compromising His own law and His own holiness. That's the mystery, except that God is willing to be gracious and provide us with something we could never provide for ourselves, we can never earn for ourselves, and that's the quintessential meaning of grace. And if you don't see your sins and your condition in that light, you don't understand sin, you don't understand the nature and character of God, you don't understand His grace, and you don't understand the gospel. But praise the Lord that He is willing to save. Thank God that He reached down His pure and His holy hand to an undeserving, sinful, and rebellious world that included you and me, and He offered to forgive and redeem. Now, that forgiveness must allow God to remain holy and true to His Word. That cannot be compromised, else He wouldn't be God. And so God doesn't just wink and look the other direction. Saving us required the vicarious sacrifice of His sinless Son. And Paul said that through placing our faith in Him who died in our stead, God can justify us or consider us as being without sin and at the same time remain the just and holy God that He is. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And in our text in Titus 2, Paul a little later down makes it clear that this grace has brought salvation. How? By Christ offering Himself, redeeming us through His sacrifice upon the cross. Now, that grace shown in Christ is a gift. We did not, will not ever earn His sacrifice. It was the gracious, loving kindness of God that provided such a plan. If you can earn it, then it's not a gift. It's a wage. And we can never place God in our debt. Therefore, Paul said in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this begs a few questions. If you were with us recently, we talked about the Bible phrase, Obey the Gospel. And we showed from the Scriptures that such obedience is necessary in order for the sinner to be saved. So do we have a contradiction? When Paul says that we are saved by grace through faith and is not of ourselves, not of works, lest we should boast, was Paul there teaching that salvation is just automatically given and there are no conditions to receiving it? Well, if that's what he's saying, then what in the world do we do with a number of other scriptures? For example, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, Christ became the author of eternal salvation. Now that's grace to all who obey Him. What do we do with the words of Jesus Himself when He said, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of My Father in heaven. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Does that not imply that there is some kind of obedience expected of a person to enter into the kingdom of heaven? What about Mark 16 verse 16? when he told the apostles to go and to preach the gospel to the whole world and then said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, you might reply that the obedience here is just to believe. That's what the obedience is, is believing. Well, first of all, we showed last week that that's not the case, but uh, that's not what Jesus said here in Mark chapter 16. And second, that wouldn't solve our seeming contradiction either because in John 6 verse 29 Jesus said, This is the work of God that you believe in Him who He sent. So if our work is to believe or put faith in Christ, then how does that square with Paul in Ephesians 2 when he says we're saved by grace through faith, not of works? When Jesus said that faith or belief is a work. And we haven't even considered yet what James said in James chapter 2. Listen to him there in James 2 verses 14 and then we'll go down to verse 20. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? 
But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Well, how can Paul say we're saved by grace through faith and not by works? And then James, also inspired of the Holy Spirit, how can he then say that faith alone does not justify its faith working together with a person's works? Who's right? Well, the fact is they're both right. Martin Luther so struggled with this seeming contradiction that at one point he thought he had to deny the inspiration of the book of James. But there's no need for that. The reformers were so opposed to the works-based salvation promoted at that time, and rightfully so. But in running away from Rome, as the old saying goes, they ran right past Jerusalem in Acts 2 verse 38. Friend, Paul and James are not talking about the same kinds of works. They're not talking about the same kind of predicate here. Paul is talking about a man working his way to heaven. Paul is talking about the person who believes he can be righteous enough for God to accept him. And he is showing the utter folly of such a thought because all have sinned. James, on the other hand, is not talking about works of merit. He's not talking about trying to earn salvation. He's not suggesting that we pile up good works and that we reach a point that God gives us salvation because we've somehow worked our way up. Not at all. You see, James is talking about the obedience of faith. He's talking about the kind of works that faith produces, and no man can boast in such. They are just that, the works of faith or trust. Faith in who? Faith in Christ. So we're not banking on a record of flawless perfection or meritorious works, else we would all be condemned. But the idea that the sinner is not expected by faith to render obedience to the gospel as a condition of receiving salvation is simply false doctrine. The question was asked on more than one occasion in the book of Acts, what must we do? Acts 2 verse 37. Or what must I do to be saved? Acts 16 and verse 30. Or uh, Lord, what will you have me to do? Asked Saul in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6. Do you know that on not one of those occasions was any of those people scolded for asking such a question? Never did the apostles rebuke them for asking in their ignorance what they must do. No, instead they told them what to do. That was not an ignorant question. They were told what to do. Look at the verses. Peter told the people in Acts 2 verse 38, when they asked, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Paul told the jailer in Acts 16 to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then he went on to explain what that meant. He declared in him the word of the Lord and the Bible says that same hour the jailer and his family were baptized. And Jesus himself told Saul to go into Tarsus, and, or, or rather not into Tarsus, but into Damascus, and a man would come and tell him what he had to do. And when Ananias got there, he told Saul to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, verse 16. We studied that in detail in our last lesson. Now preachers today tell you there's nothing a sinner must do. It's all done for you. Just, just believe it and that's it. Well, that sounds good. It preaches good, but that's not what the Bible says. And that's not what Paul was teaching in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. In fact, while we're talking about Saul or Paul, I want us to see something interesting that he later said in Acts 22. You know, long after he became a Christian and an apostle, Paul was arrested at the temple in Jerusalem. And as he was being led away, he was allowed to address the mob around him, and he gave a defense of his faith and his conversion. He told the story of what happened on the Damascus Road and how the Lord appeared before him and how he asked the Lord what he wanted him to do. And I want you to listen to how Paul recounted the Lord's response in verse 10. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And as I pointed out last time, Saul already believed in Jesus. 
There was no doubt that Jesus was resurrected now that he saw him and heard him speak. He had already repented. Uh, his heart had already been turned. He was ready to take orders from the Lord. But there was still something for him to do. And he learned what that was only when Ananias came and instructed him to immediately get up and be baptized to wash away his sins and call on the name of the Lord. He wasn't told, by the way, to put it off for a week or two or three weeks or a month until baptism Sunday. He was told immediately, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, was Saul saved by grace? Absolutely he was. But did Saul have to be baptized to wash away his sins and call on the name of the Lord, as we just read? Yes, he did. Friend, when you submit to Christ in baptism, you're not earning anything. You're placing your faith in Jesus to save you by submitting to His gospel command. Paul puts this beautifully in Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. Read it very carefully. He says, buried with him. Listen now, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When did they come to life? being forgiven of their sins, when they were raised with Him after being buried with Him in the waters of baptism, and as Paul taught in Romans 6, after having died to their sin when they were buried and then rose again from the waters of baptism. And in so doing, Paul says, you are placing your faith in the operation of God. God does the work. The glory goes to Him. But He does that work when in faith we submit to the command of His Son and are baptized into union with Him. And yes, that is salvation by grace through faith, not of ourselves. That is faith working together with obedience, as James referred to it, resulting in justification. That's the redeeming grace of God. Now the devil doesn't want you to know all of that. He works very hard to pervert the gospel to tinge the gospel with false doctrine just enough that it sounds believable, but people are kept away from the truth. And make no mistake, He wants to keep you away from the forgiveness of sins, a right relationship with God, salvation. And He uses as subtle and devious of a means to do it as He can. And He uses religious teachers to convince people of His error. He wants you to believe that God's grace is just unconditionally received and applied when as we have shown the Word of God teaches otherwise. Now, Lord willing, next week we will see the next thing Paul refers to in Titus 2 about the grace of God. It is not only a redeeming grace, it is also a reaching grace. Who does it reach? Who is the grace of God for? Who can receive it? And also it's a reforming grace, and it's a rejoicing grace. And I hope you'll join me to learn what we mean by those great themes in the second half of our study next week. I'll return to tell you how to get a copy of today's lesson after another song. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday you'll record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it
subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak Classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Denying the grace of God leaves us in a hopeless condition, but exploiting the grace of God is just as dangerous. We don't want to do either one. We want to appreciate and we want to receive God's grace and not receive it in vain. I hope that you'll join me next week as we continue our study and talk about these three other aspects of God's grace that Paul teaches in this wonderful passage. And if you'd like a printed copy of today's lesson, get in touch with us and ask for the lesson, The Grace of God, Part 1, and that printed copy will be on its way as soon as we can get it to you. Uh, anything we ever offer here on the program is free of cost. We're not here for your money. We're simply thankful that you watch the program from week to week, and we hope that you benefit from studying the Word of God together. We hope you'll spread the Word about our program. One of the ways you can do that is to be sure to subscribe and like our various social media pages and platforms and share the content with your friends and your loved ones. We would certainly appreciate that, and you never know who might hear the gospel and obey it as a result. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that you have a great week ahead, and if God wills, I'll meet you back here next time for our next study. Until then, have a great week. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.